So, let's start. So I want everybody to think back to your childhood, okay? Think back to a time when you said something totally off the chain. And I want you to think about a time when you said something completely mean, whatever it was, in front of an authority figure. Be that your parents, a teacher, grandparents, whoever had authority over you. And what was their response? I know for me growing up, my mom used to always say, if you have nothing nice to say, then don't say anything at all. And I never loved when she said that because whenever she told me that, it was usually after I just said something that I thought was completely justified, usually to my little brother after we were in a fight. And so my thoughts were that if he's gonna release his full vengeance on me, then I have every right to do the same thing. Uh, these are my BC days, so give me some grace. Um, but yeah, so, and I think it's really interesting. Um, I don't know who your people were that gave you warnings about your speech or what they said, but I think it's really interesting growing up in this age, in this generation, and seeing how we've kind of altered the way that we use speech. Um, it's really interesting because we have grown up in this age of social media where it's venerated and revered to keep it real and to speak the truth and say it how it is. Um, and I think it's great that we've come to a place where we can openly and honestly talk about a lot of things that were maybe um, taboo to talk about in the past. I think it's good that we have that dialogue. However, when we revere this idea of saying it how it is without thinking about how our words impact other people, we lose our sensitivity to what we are saying. Um, yeah, and that's just not cool. That's not how it should be. And the really cool thing is that we get to dive into a passage today. Obviously, this isn't just a problem with our generation because James had something to say about it a long time ago, um, and it's still relevant. And so James, as we dive into this passage um, in James 3, we get to see why James thinks that our speech is so important. And we get to answer that question for ourselves. And there's gonna be some awkward times where I'm going to pause and let you think because I was told to do that and we need to think about what we're like what we're saying and like how we're saying it so bear with me and so just walk with me as we talk about why does our speech matter so I'm going to read the passage and then pray and then just get in there man all right James 3 starting at verse 1 not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. If y'all would pray with me. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity um, to be here among brothers and sisters. Lord, and I pray that your spirit would, be, would move within me and that the words coming out of my mouth are your words, especially as we are talking about speaking. Um, and I just pray for your spirit to move within my brothers and sisters, and I pray that um, you would be glorified. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. All right, let's start at the beginning. Let's look at verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. First, Sam, Shannon, 
I want to say thank you for picking this passage for me that begins with not many of you should become teachers and then telling me to teach it. Um, There's no pressure there at all. Um, So yeah, so James begins by advising us to be weary of becoming teachers. Um, And I honestly, when I first read this, I was confused. I was like, James, what does this have to do with speech? I get the rest of the passage for the most part, but this is kind of came out of left field. And so, in order to kind of put into perspective, I want you guys to think about a different James. LeBron James. So, if you do not know who LeBron James is, he's a very well-known and talented athlete in the NBA, the National Basketball Association. Um, And LeBron, I won't go into all the controversy surrounding him, but he uh, is very skilled, and many would say that he's gifted in basketball, right? And so whatever team that LeBron James is on, um, he holds a higher sense of responsibility than the rest of the team. And so when he was on the Cavs and they lost, it was, oh, LeBron should have done this better, LeBron should have done this, blah, 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 blah. The responsibility was much more on his shoulders than it was on anybody else's. When they win, it's like, oh, yeah, LeBron is great, he's awesome, blah, 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 all these things. And so LeBron has this responsibility within the NBA and within the team that he is playing for. And think about if LeBron sends a really crazy t- tweet. You know, LeBron tweets, and what if he sends something that's just completely off the wall, off the chain? He is going to have so many consequences to pay for that because he reaches millions of people, and millions of people look up to him. Millions of people are waiting to just jump on him and waiting for him to make a mistake. Um, so there are repercussions to his actions. And so LeBron, as the leader of the NBA team, we can see, wow, he's in the spotlight a lot. But now let's think about teachers. And here James is referring to biblical teachers. Um, And although they aren't in the same spotlight as LeBron, they have so much more importance than LeBron. Uh, Biblical teachers are leading other people, other believers in their walk with Christ. Biblical teachers are responsible for shepherding people and showing them the truth that was within this word and guiding people through that. it's so much more weighty. And we've seen the impacts of bad biblical teaching that have lasted for centuries. Slavery was justified using the word. And we see the repercussions of that in our society today. Biblical teaching is so important. And so James uses this passage, and he goes even further to show us how teaching is tied to our speech and why that's important. So in verse 2, James says, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is able to keep their whole bodies in check. All right, so bear with me for a second. I want everybody who knows somebody who is a perfectionist to raise their hand, if you know somebody who's a perfectionist. Okay, hands down. Raise your hand if you are that perfectionist. Embrace it, it's okay. Yes, okay, that's fine. Um, And so I have good news for you people. If you just always say the right thing in the right way, in the right tone at the right time, and never say the wrong thing in the wrong way in the wrong tone at the wrong time, you have arrived. James has given you the key to perfection. Um, but in all, in all seriousness, um, James is telling us that, like, how can we as teachers not be practicing the things that we preach from Sunday to Sunday or Wednesday to Wednesday? How can the people that are following you trust you and how can they trust the God that you're exalting if you aren't laying out the foundation um, and you're not following that foundation yourself? So um, the interesting thing is James isn't the only person in the Bible who has something to say about speech. Jesus also had some things to say about it. Um, There's a passage in Luke where um, Jesus is teaching as he does so well. And um, yeah, he's talking about one particular phrase that he uses. He says, for out of, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. How many of you have ever said something to somebody that you love out of anger? How many of you have ever said something to the effect of, I hate you, to your parents and your rebellious teenagers? 
How many of you have had to apologize for a joke that you thought was hilarious but landed completely offensively in somebody else's domain? What we say and how we say it is indicative of what is within us, what's in our hearts. And that's our first point. Our speech, why does it matter? It matters because it reveals who we are. It reveals what's going on in here. Um, I know that there's been times when I have just like offhandedly said something to somebody like really snappy and then I kind of look up and I'm like, did I just say that? <laughs> like did those words really just come out of my mouth? And then of course my first response is to just apologize, be like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Like I don't know where that came from. But I might not know like consciously where it came from, but that's, there's something in me, okay? There's something in me that's wrong that had me, that sin, that just had that visceral response. And so I just want you guys to start thinking about your speech and just be aware that it's a gracious warning from God. If you realize that the things coming out of your mouth are literal garbage, the Lord is telling you there's something in there that needs to be fixed. So first point, our speech reveals who we are. What else does it do and why else does it matter? If you'll look with me in verse 3, James says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. So James in this section uses a lot of illustrations, which is great because that means I don't have to come up with more illustrations, so it's easier on me. Um, and I just want to walk through each of them for a bit because I'm going to be real with you. I didn't know what some of these things were when I first read it. So, horse bit. This, I learned, is a small piece, we'll just call it technology. And it kind of looks like this, and it goes in the mouth of the horse. And connected to the bit are the reins that the uh, person who's riding the horse, the rider, um, holds on to. And so when the rider pulls the reins to the left, the horse's um, head turns left, and the whole animal turns left and goes left. Same thing when they go to the right. And when the rider wants the horse to slow down, it'll pull on both of the reins, the horse's entire head will pull back, and the horse will slow down. I don't know if you guys knew this, but horses can range from 800 to about 2,500 pounds. That's a lot of animal that is controlled by such a small piece of technology. And rudder. I had a vague idea of what a horse bit was, but rudder, I'm real, I had no idea what a rudder was until I saw The Incredibles 2. And I won't give any spoilers, but Mr. Incredible has to go and jump into the water and turn the rudder of a ship in order to turn the ship because the, I don't know what the thing is called that you actually steer with was like ripped off. So he had to go underneath the water and like manually turn the rudder. And so whenever he turned it, the whole entire ship would turn. And it's the same concept, right? A very small piece of the hole controls this whole large thing. And I don't know the statistics on how sh big ships can be, but I know they can be bigger than horses. So it's a lot. Um, and I hope all of you have some familiarity with fire. Um, so I'm just going to paint this picture for you. So for the sake of the illustration, it'll be a guy. Um, so a guy is riding in his car. It's a nice summer day. Windows are down and jamming to some music, just chilling. And he's smoking a cigarette. And so he's at the end of his cigarette, and he's like, well, this is done. I'm just going to toss it out the window without putting out the cigarette butt. And so homeboy is like on down the road, not thinking about his actions at all. But the cigarette butt still has a spark on the end of it. And he threw it into this dry brush on the side of the road that is connected to forest. And so within a matter of hours, acres of forest have been engulfed and destroyed by the flame, by a seemingly harmless spark at the end of a cigarette butt. And James uses these examples really well because he paints, he gives us two messages. So the horse bit and the rudder of a ship, they have this very clear message of a small thing controlling the whole. Control. Our speech controls who we are. But the fire, this is the interesting part, it's 
This is a picture of destruction. Fire destroys. So we have these two messages, one of control and one of destruction, given by these uh, three examples. And as I was researching and preparing for this sermon, I was like, who, who else in the Bible has something to say about speech? And I was honestly floored by the amount of hard hitters in the Bible who have something to say about the way that we speak. For example, in Proverbs, Solomon tells us a soft answer turns away wrath and harsh words stir up anger. In Psalms, we see David pleading with God to put a guard over his own mouth. And in Ephesians, Paul tells us to let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only what is good for building up. So why does it matter? Why do so many people in the Bible, Solomon, Paul, James, Jesus, why do they care about what we say? And so that brings us to our second point. Our speech influences the rest of our lives. It has incredible influence over our lives. It can control the rest of our lives, and it can potentially be very destructive. So our speech matters because it reveals who we are and because it influences the course of our lives. And so the potential destruction and evil of our speech is further fleshed out, and this is where James kind of goes in on our speech, okay? So look with me in verse 6. James says, The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. <laughs> James thinks that our speech is set on fire by hell. That is very strong language. And I think it's really interesting how James focuses on, almost exclusively on the negative impacts of our speech. Yes, our speech can be uplifting and it can be um, edifying to those around us, but James isn't talking about that. He is, his focus is on warning us about the potential evil and destruction um, for our speech. And I want to I talk about this, this taming animals part. Um, <laughs> when I was growing up, my parents finally caved and they got my brother and I a dog. Um, my brother and I were in elementary school, and he was really cute. We got him as a puppy, and it was a Lhasa Apso. So um, he was this little, small ball of fur that could fit in your hands. Super cute. We were so excited. And I don't know if it was because he was so cute that my dad thought we had to give him like a manly name, but we named him Samson. Um, and so we loved Samson for about the first month. And then we realized, one, my brother and I, being elementary kids and never having a pet before ever, didn't really have a concept of how to tame an animal. Um, and so Samson, although we tried sit and he didn't respond in the first two tries, so we kind of was like, well, he's untamable. Um, so he wasn't trained um, very well. And uh, he didn't listen. He ate all of our baseboards and windowsills. Um, he had this weird, like, dog ADHD where he would, like, run up and down the stairs and, like, run into our glass window, bounce back, and then, like, keep running all over the place. And then every time we put him outside, he would find a way to dig under the fence and run away. So obviously when James is saying that humans have tamed animals, he gave my family too much credit. But... The point is that humans have been able to tame animals. You don't have to be a Christian to be able to train a dog. It's just, it's just not one of those requirements. However, James tells us that no human being can tame the tongue. And it's important that he says human being because we do have the potential to tame our tongues through the power of the Holy Spirit through God's power. We cannot do it in our own power because we will fail, try as we might. But we, yeah, we, we have to submit ourselves and our will to Christ to be able to control what we're saying and how we're saying it. So getting into our third point, 
our speech has an incredible potential for evil. And this is where a lot of James is, uh, in, he insists on this fact that our speech has great potential for evil. And he goes on to expand, that, expand on that in the last part of this um, passage. In verse 9 he says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Going back to the first time when I read this, this was the part that shook me. This was the part that hit me right in the feels because this is me, okay? I cannot tell you how many times I have been driving in the car, worship music blasting, I'm singing along, thinking I sound amazing, uh, when, like AC is on, I'm having a good old time, and then somebody who was made in God's image cuts me off <laughs> and almost endangers my life. And I go from worshiping God to saying, I despise you, sir, which is terrible, and I know I'm, I'm a work in progress. But that's exactly what James is saying. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings. And I am as guilty of that as anybody here. Um, and I don't know what your trigger is. Maybe your trigger isn't traffic in Dallas. And if it's not, please talk to me after service and share with me how you do it because <laughs> it's just really hard. Um, maybe your trigger are your parents. Maybe it's school. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your spouse, your significant other. I don't know what your trigger is, but the point is we cannot claim to be a people wholly devoted to serving Christ and also cursing the humans who God has made himself in his own image, Christian or not. It doesn't work. And so do you remember when I, when I talked about the Luke passage when Jesus said the mouth speaks what the heart is full of? This is why you guys get an entire sermon on speech rather than just a five-minute snippet at the end of a sermon about living righteously. It's because our speech does matter and it points to something else that's much more important, the state of our hearts. And so James kind of lists out these impossibilities. Fresh water and salt water. They can't come from the same place. Salt water primarily exists in oceans. Fresh water, lakes and rivers, and some rivers. Um, fig trees and grapevines. I don't eat figs or olives, so I had to look this up as well. But fig trees are trees, <laughs> and they bear figs. And grapevines produce olives. Um, you can't have a fig tree that's going to pop out some olives or a grapevine that's just going to magically produce figs. It's unnatural, it doesn't work, and that's not how God intended for his nature to grow. And for an example that's at least more relevant to me, I love milk. Milk is probably my favorite drink. And so if somebody gives me a glass of milk, that's full, clear glass of milk, and I see it. It's white. It's looking delicious. It's probably 2% because that's, that's, that's where I'm at. Um, so a full glass of milk, and then they say, oh, no, that glass isn't full of milk. It's full of water. I'm like, what? No, it's not. I see it. Like, it's full of milk. There's no way that it can be full of water. Um, they're like, no, 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 it's full of milk. You're crazy. I don't know if there's, like, a clear color blindness, but you have that. Um, and so there is, these things cannot exist in the same thing. We can't be wholly devoted to God, and we can't be wholly devoted to cursing our brothers and sisters, or maybe not even brothers and sisters, just other Christians in the world. And so, we, why does our speech matter? One, it reveals who we are. Two, it influences our life in a very great fashion. And three, it has incredible potential for evil. So the next logical question is how do we then control it? 
Um, it would be really funny if I just kind of left you with that. Just be like, yeah, your speech sucks. Like, how do you deal with it? Um, so, how do we control our speech? One thing that I do want to encourage you guys not to do is to just fix the symptoms. So if you do look at yourself and you are like, wow, I really don't say nice things all the time. I don't have a good control over my tongue. Um, the solution to that is not to just stop speaking. There are several people out there who are very quiet and have very ugly hearts, uh, very ugly, ugly insides, and that's not the goal. Um, so we really want to get to the root of the matter. So first, this is where the awkward part comes in. So I hope you guys are ready. Um, the first thing that I want you guys to do is to stop and examine your own lives. And think about when is your speech the most untamed? What time of the day? Where are you at? Um, who are the people in your life that encourage you to speak mindfully and to speak truth and to speak life? Who are the people that encourage you to speak hate? Maybe hang out with these people a little more. And then what is your speech saying about your heart? So I'm gonna give you guys a couple, couple seconds to think about, to examine your thoughts, just think about them. Okay, hopefully we at least have one instance or one time of the day or scenario when your speech is the most untamed. Now, you get to think some more, <laughs> and I want you to think about the why. Why do you feel the urge to curse out the person that's just cut in front of you? Why do you so often speak anger to those that you claim to love? So think about the times when you're speaking all crazy-like, and think about the why. I can take ownership for my, my stuff, and with the just expanding on the driving example, I could say that it brings me so much wrath when somebody cuts in front of me because they just endangered my life. I could cop out with that excuse, and that would be an easy excuse, and it would almost be like righteous in a sense. But that's, that's not the whole truth. The reason why I think I can get so um, off the chain with my speech when somebody cuts me off is because I have a sense of entitlement. I think that things should go my way and if they don't go my way then I'm going to be upset about it and I'm going to blame it on somebody else. You messed up the way that I thought that this drive was supposed to go. Um, you made my heart rate increase. Don't do that. And so that's me. That's my why. At least in the driving situations. I, I'm preaching this to you and Lord knows that I have a lot of work to do in this area of taming my own tongue. So there are lots of reasons why. But the next step is you've pinpointed the areas. You've thought about why. Pray over them. Submit those areas to God. Be like, God, <laughs> at work, I am a mess. I gossip all the time. I need help. I need you to just, I confess this before you, help us just out. Um, submit it to God and then ask for accountability. Um, maybe your thing is gossip at work. Let's go with that. Um, talk to the people around you. See if there are like-minded people around you who also want to stop gossiping at work and think that that's not an uplifting or great thing to do. And then 
you can go on Pinterest because Pinterest has really awesome ideas and cute ways to keep yourself accountable. accountable. So you can have like an accountability jar um, and be cute doing it. So that's my plug for Pinterest. Everybody should have a Pinterest. Um, but yeah, pray about it. Ask for accountability. Be in community with other people and be honest and open about your sins and your why. And then practice. Practice telling the truth in love. Practice driving in Dallas and praying for drivers. And maybe even praying that God grants the money to get more driving classes. You know, whatever God lays on your heart, let the Lord work on your heart. And brothers and sisters, our tongue is small. It's a very small part of our body, but its impact is not. And so as we close, I just want to remind you guys that James didn't write this book to bully or scare Christians into obedience. If your obedience to God is fueled by solely fear of punishment um, and not out of an outpouring of love that you have for God and your relationship with him, then you should check that. Check your heart. When Jesus was dragged up the hill with the cross on his back, bloody and mangled and exhausted and sweating blood and abandoned by the Father, experiencing more suffering than any of us have ever experienced in our lives, he knew He knew he was dying for a sinful people. He knew that you would say that thing to your spouse that has driven a wedge in your marriage for the last five years. He knew that you would say that thing to your best friend that they can't forgive you for. He knew that, but he died for you anyways. And he did it because he's good. He's good. And the thing that blows my mind is when we look at Jesus' speech, as he was hanging on the cross, his words were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We who put him on that cross, who were mocking him, beat him senselessly, he asked God for our forgiveness. And that is our model. That's our goal. That is who we are striving to be and who we are striving to worship. And so James hits hard in this book because living right under God is important. Um, It's an important part of our faith, and it's something that we should all strive to do. Um, However, God is a God of forgiveness and of grace and of mercy. And we have to remember that in our talks Um, the way that we're speaking, when we mess up, pray about it, ask God for forgiveness, and then try again, and know that you are living in that forgiveness. And so as we transition, um, I'm I'm just going to pray before we do this, but my prayer is that we would come before God with hearts that are full of confession and repentance for the way that we speak and for the way that our hearts are evil and sinful and desire the things that bring shame to the Lord, but we would also come with hearts full of thankfulness because God asked for our forgiveness and we have it. If we belong to Christ, we have the forgiveness of God. Yeah. All right, I'm going to pray. <sighs> Jesus. Um. I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters here in this room, Lord, and I just pray that you would forgive us for the ways that we have failed you, um, that we can come before you and confess that, Lord, and turn away from our sinfulness and our evil and our brokenness, Lord, and that we we acknowledge that we can only do that in your power. And Lord, we thank you for your work for us on the cross. Um, There is nothing sweeter than knowing that we belong to you eternally. And so we give that back to you, Lord, and we pray for your grace and your mercy as we continue and strive to walk this walk for you. 
We love you and we thank you. And it's your name that we pray. Amen.